Welcome to An Honorable Profession, a podcast giving America hope since 2018. I'm Ryan Coonerty. Along with Debbie Cox Bolton of the New Deal, I'm lucky enough to be your co-host. An Honorable Profession is a New Deal Leaders podcast. The New Deal is an organization that supports the next generation of American leaders. From attorneys generals, to state senators, to mayors, to school board members, these are the people that are pushing policies and politics that will respond to climate change, rebuild our economy, address racial injustice, and restore our democracy. These are incredibly talented people who have dedicated themselves to public service when their country and their communities need it the most. Check out NewDealLeaders.org to see what I'm talking about. Welcome to An Honorable Profession. I'm Debbie Cox Bolton, CEO of The New Deal, where we're proud to support some of the inspiring leaders you hear on this podcast. In this episode, I talked with Hans Reamer, an at-large member of the Montgomery, Maryland County Council, who's currently running for county executive. We talked about making tough decisions, what it's been like to govern during covid and his vision for a sustainable future and clean energy economy, including public transportation, transit-oriented development, and innovations in solar energy. It was really fun and inspiring to hear Hans talk about his path into public service, from being a kid under the PTA table in Oakland, California, to becoming national political director for Rock the Vote, and how he got connected to a certain young U.S. senator from Illinois. Hans Reamer, welcome to an honorable profession. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. I've been enjoying this podcast and I love the New Deal. So it's exciting to be with you. And thank you, Debbie. Of course. So happy to have you. It's so fun to interview my friends that I've known for a long time. I say this sometimes and I always learn something new about people when I do these podcasts with them. So I thought I'd start with a question actually that I didn't, I knew that you were an at-large council member for Montgomery County, Maryland. But in researching for this, I was reminded that you guys have a mix of both at-large and district seats, which is kind of unique, actually, I think. And I was just kind of curious to start with, like, how does that work? And is is the goal there to try to, you know, maximize representation? Or how, how would you describe how that council works? Oh, it's very interesting. Well, we do. We have four at-large council members who are elected to represent the whole county. And we are about a million people in the county. And in Maryland, the county is really the main local government. So I grew up in California. The county level of government was not something that people knew much about, you know, it was somewhat more obscured, but in Maryland, that's really, you know, the, like the County executive of Montgomery County, it's really the mayor of Montgomery County for a million people. So there's four of us who are elected to represent the County. It's a big County. You know, we've got like farmland, we've got suburban areas, we've got urban areas, and uh, it's an exciting job to be tasked to represent so many different, diverse and complex communities, uh, with all of the various needs and try to figure out how to synthesize all that into your agenda and your policy strategy. But it's certainly also an interesting balance with district council members who, of course, have some prerogative, you know, in their district. And at the same time, you know, as an at-large council member, I represent those voters too. And so there's always a little bit of a, a flow, like a little dynamic there to you know, it's a little bit different with different council members, that's for sure. Yeah, serving as an at-large council member is thrilling because, yes, I have constituent service. You know, it's an important part of the job, but I'm not necessarily the front line of constituent service requests from, you know, someone who is in the community. They might be more likely to go to their district council member. Although if they come to me, you know, we've got a great team and we're on it. So I get a little bit more of the balance towards working on policy and legislative issues, certainly that's also what I enjoy, you know, so it, I, I enjoy that very much, I should say. So it, it's a really exciting role. I think it's so interesting how different people are elected and how how big councils are. It's just it's fascinating that local government looks so different all over the country, to your point about California. But I'd love to start talking to you about kind of your tenure on the council. You were first elected in 2010 when, of course, we were all trying to recover from the recession. So you you started in one uh, <laughs> one uh, very dramatic time yeah. period and now we're sitting in another. But so thinking back when you were first elected, kind of what was your you know role in trying to bring Montgomery County out? out of the recession, get people back to work, put the county back on, you know, some kind of fiscal stability path. That must have been a really hard time to to be a new elected official. 
It was. It was. We had to make some really tough decisions at that time. And, you know, I have always felt, and it especially was true at that time, that it was it was a tough to reconcile, you know, your own what you knew was going to have a big impact on your political viability in the future versus what you knew you had to do uh, in order to serve the community. It, you know, essentially like duty is calling here and it, it might not be the most convenient thing for someone who aspires to serve in political office. So yeah, we, you know, in those first couple of years that I joined the council, we, we had a huge, huge decline of our tax revenue, you know, because our county, we have something that most local governments don't. We have a income tax revenue source. So the state, you know, levies the income tax. We get an additional share of income tax, and we have a lot of high income individuals in the county. And so about 40% of our money comes from income tax. Well, after the Great Recession, that just got crushed. And so suddenly we were down, you know, 30% on our tax revenue. And that is really tough for local governments to, you know, to, to reconcile. You know, usually it's tough when your revenue is down by a percentage point or two, but when you're down, you know, 25%, you have to kind of throw everything out the window and, and start over. So yeah, we had to make a lot of tough decisions about compensation, you know, to try to ensure that we have sustainable compensation because you know, compensation is what government does. It's a people business and somewhere between 70 and 90% of the money that we spend is on compensation. And so if you don't have the, you know, if, if your revenues take a 25% hit and 90% of your expenditures are on people, then there's no way to get through that without uh, addressing that compensation factor. So that was tough, you know, as a, as a, it was, I know it's personally tough for me as a, someone who comes out of uh, democratic labor politics, you know, all, all of my career working closely with unions to advance social justice causes, you know, to have to be on their side of the table and to try to figure out how to get through it together, you know, as best we can. But, you know, it also felt like it was important and it was, it was necessary. But we also put in place at that time a lot of long term fiscal policies that, you know, have made a big difference, saving for retiree health expenditures, you know, ensuring that our pensions are are well run and, and fully funded. So we had to do a lot of that kind of heavy lifting. And at the same time, just match up our expenses with our with our revenue and make cuts everywhere we could. And uh, you know, I'll never forget my my first two weeks on the job voting to try to save like twenty thousand dollars for a senior nutrition program. You know, in a in a nearly five billion dollar budget, you know, and it was coming down to cutting individual items like fifteen thousand, twenty thousand here and there. So, you know, that's always stuck with me. I think that you know you've got to be prepared for that at any time. And I I thought we were going to be heading back into that with the pandemic. You know, at at the beginning, as we were working on our budget in twenty twenty, and the pandemic was obviously crushing. To me, it seemed like we were. We we must be heading into something like that, and thank goodness that we haven't. You know, it, it we we have largely dodged any kind of economic overall calamity, although it has been calamitous for certain kinds of businesses and sectors, no doubt. But yeah, I was anticipating we were going to have to do that all over again, and I wasn't really looking forward to it. Yeah, I hear you. I, and although I do think that what you said about kind of having to do the right thing, even if it's the hard thing, probably did apply to COVID when there were public health decisions to be made, when there were other kind of painful decisions and a lot of uncertainty and, and fear. That there's probably a, um, some similarities about when you first, COVID first arrived in your county and being a, a leader at that time. What, what was that like? Yeah, it was tough. You know, I mean, I, I'll never forget hearing that the schools were going to close. And I turned to a friend of mine, you know, a council member, and I said, you know, you know, I can't, I can't believe this is going to happen. You know, you think we'll get them back in a, hopefully in a couple of weeks. And he said, oh, they're not coming back. And that was in March. And I remember thinking at the time, like, wow, the schools closing for three weeks would be an utterly devastating impact on our kids and on our schools. And then, you know, what we have actually had to work through, essentially that whole, that whole semester was lost, you know, that spring was lost. And then the massive impact to learning last year. And then again, this year in the fall, when we came back and now in January, when we're coming back, I don't know, it's, uh, it is really difficult. It's really tough. It, it keeps me up at night because 
growing up, like ensuring educational opportunity for disadvantaged kids was something that I saw was so powerful and so important. It's something that's motivated me into public service and to see all around us, you know, that it is, it's, it's the kids who have fewer opportunities who are really making the least amount of progress now. It's distressing. And, you know, it's something that it's just, we've got to, we've got to accelerate and and make changes in order to address that problem, because otherwise we're going to be paying consequence, you know, dealing with the impact of this for a really, really, really long time. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to come back and talk about what got you into public service, but I want to stick here for um, kind of on COVID and on where we are right now for a minute. But, you know, as we think about, to your point about, you know, building back, right, you know, and, and this moment in time, of course, with crisis comes opportunity and that, we're, we've got to think about how do we real, re, you know, build back better to use the president's phrase, of course, you know, but to address some of those, those issues that were absolutely there before the pandemic, some of these longstanding inequities, and whether it was in education or access to healthcare or transit or housing or whatever it was, those were there. And they were just, you know, the spotlight was shown on them during COVID. And now as a, as a county leader, you get this opportunity to try to address some of those as we as we rebuild from COVID. So what are your priorities when you think about where we need to invest? to kind of build an America that works better for everybody. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, uh, I am so there for Joe Biden's framework of build back better. First of all, a finger on the pulse of where we need to be. And I think we're all grappling with just the never ending impact of this and the lack of ability to get focused on building back better. Cause we're still dealing with the here and now, yeah. which is very frustrating, but hopefully that's subsiding now with Omicron and we'll be able to really come running out the gate. You know, for me, I think it really starts with education. And, and then I think second is small business, but our, our kids, as we all know, have you know, not made as much progress over the past two years, especially in a County like Montgomery County, where Schools were closed for longer. They were hybrid for longer, and kids were just getting a lot less in-person education. And that has led to all kinds of other social challenges. You know, we're experiencing a massive crime wave, and you know, I think it's tied into a lot of these social impacts from uh, Omicron. So, first and foremost, is we've got to have a multi-year plan for addressing what we've lost or what we haven't gained in education and help these kids get back to where they need to be. And, you know, that's, I don't think there's much that's more important to do than that. There are a lot of businesses that closed up and business owners are struggling with, you know, huge liabilities. And, you know, I really think we need to help them navigate that environment. And, you know, we're providing a lot of grants and technical support for for business owners. But, uh, you know, I, I think the To me, it seems like the biggest loss is really with our kids now, and we've just got to get focused on that with with tutoring programs and after school programs, and um, you know, athletics, and double down on on public education. Yeah, absolutely. I've got two kids uh, in high school, and I couldn't agree more with that (laughs) and and how you know, the, both the gaps in access and broadband and, you know, and how the learning loss, we cannot go back and there's so much work to be done. So I appreciate that sentiment for sure. Another place where you've really worked a lot of your career, and we have an opportunity with some federal dollars through the infrastructure bill is on things like public transportation and affordable housing in particular. Tell us a little bit about your plan for public transit in Montgomery County and um, and how you and kind of your vision for, for how this, all these pieces fit together. You know, Montgomery County is a big wedge in, in, in the Washington region. You know, we have urban, suburban, and, and we have rural. And we have a couple of major transit projects that we're trying to get done. And the first one is the Purple Line. And we, I, I think we are going to be able to get access to some of the federal infrastructure dollars to help that project come to completion. It's been a very, actually, a, a challenging experience with that project. It's a public-private partnership to build a transit line, which is not 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 that common uh, to build it and to operate it and to maintain it. And unfortunately, you know, due to lawsuits brought against the the you know the project, basically everything came to a stop. And the the, the line is now four years late in opening and it has gone uh, more than a billion dollars over budget. So that is like really problematic. And you know we need to 
get into that purple line and get it done right. And there's been a lot of battles over how to, you know, what kind of not finishing touches, but what, you know, various tunnels and other elements of the design and how much to spend on them. And, you know, I I think it's going to have a huge positive impact on our future to have this transit line. It's like a rail, it's light rail that connects the whole metro system so that the county can be much better connected with high quality rail transit. But then the next the next, uh, I think, evolution for us is going to be high quality surface bus transit. And, you know, we're not, we don't have any more heavy rail planned or, or light rail planned at this time, but we are working on a number of um, bus rapid transit systems. And we have the opportunity to build one on our major, what is really our major corridor, Route 50, 355, Wisconsin Avenue, that goes right up. It starts in DC, actually, at the at, uh, at Georgetown, and uh, it's the old Port Road. And uh, Maryland gave Georgetown over to create the, uh, the District of Columbia, but that road goes all the way up through Montgomery County. It, it's, uh, you know, it is the spine of our county. And I would like to rebuild that road to be a, a city. You know, this county needs to have a city. And we've been a, a suburban community forever, and we're sort of gradually transitioning into having urban nodes. But we need our main boulevard to be a, a the spine of a city. And I think the federal infrastructure dollars are going to help us accelerate that by providing funding to rebuild the pike, we call it Rockville Pike, and layer in not only a bus rapid surface transit system, but also walkable and bikeable infrastructure. And then we'll have Metro uh, running underground and, and then surface bus transit and biking and walking infrastructure and basically create that, that landscape that we need to have dense housing and an exciting environment and a place where companies want to be and a place that we can really grow our future. So we want to build the surface transit systems, uh, bus transit on the Rockville Pike, also on the east part of the county on Route 29. And then what we're really struggling with is how to connect to Virginia. And you know our region has really changed a lot, and we don't have a transit connection that really is efficient to get to Virginia. So we're looking at how bus rapid transit can provide that across the bridge. And then finally, the last major piece is, you know, Mark, we have a commuter rail, uh, sort of like the Northeastern commuter rail systems, but ours doesn't really run frequently. It, It only runs one direction. It's not very frequent. So I've been part of a group of elected officials working hard to get that system turned into another layer of a commuter rail system for for the state and for the, the Washington region. And I think hopefully the um, the federal infrastructure dollars are going to help us take some big strides forward on that, uh, particularly if we can get a, a Democratic governor in, you know, after November and and make that a priority. So there are there are lots of opportunities. And, you know, fortunately we've got a lot of projects underway and and we should be able to pull some of that federal dollar uh, some of those federal dollars into them. And, um, you know, we'll see how it goes. It's still definitely just taking shape. Yeah, that's, that's exciting. Actually, there's a lot, a lot there. And, and I know it sounds like, you know, that's going to help with the economic development, right, in terms of connecting all these places. I know another big place that you've spent some of your time thinking about is on climate and, and, and a lot of that public transportation, some of that density issues that all kind of plays into your, your passion for, you know, addressing climate change as well, I think. Absolutely. You know, smart growth is one of the big things that local governments can do. You know, our our, our emissions really are coming from, you know, transportation and and buildings. You know, those two sectors are where most of the pollution is coming from locally. You know, those are hard, hard systems to to change. Uh, They don't change overnight. But, you know, with transportation, we can build more public transportation systems. We can use tolls. You know, we can do things more biking and walking infrastructure. And then with housing, you know, we can ensure that new housing is close to public transportation. You know, those are all really, really crucial. I am a strong believer in, in solar and, and electrification. Uh, electrification is a vision for how the economy can transition entirely to being a clean energy economy, which we can accomplish by no longer relying upon fossil fuel building machines. 
and switching all of those machines to being electric and then powered by solar or wind or nuclear or other sources of clean energy. And I think that is, you know, it's a vision that actually works. And for the first time in my life, I feel optimistic that we're actually, there is a path to deal with climate change, to slow these trends and to reverse them. And that path goes through electrification. We've got to get every, you know, we got to get people not to drive, but then to the extent that they drive, we've got to get folks using plug-in electric vehicles that are charged from clean energy. And if we can do that, which I think we could do actually very rapidly, you know, 10, 15 years, we ought to be able to substantially change our vehicle fleet in this country. We could have a massive impact on emissions as long as the what the cars are plugging into is clean power. So that's that's the big, the next big thing is how do we run our homes and our vehicles off of clean power? And a major part of the answer is solar. So one of the initiatives that I have worked really hard on is how can Montgomery County generate our share of solar power? And what we're seeing is that it's really hard and slow to do just rooftops and parking lots. And, you know, we've had that as an option for decades, and we only have just the, the smallest amount of, of solar that's been created. But the county also has about a third of all of our land that's been designated for farming. We have about 100,000 acres of, of land that's been designated for farming in perpetuity through a zoning that is intended to only allow for farming. And I have gotten really excited about this idea of blending solar and farming. And what you can do actually is that farmland, if you don't do commodity farming, if you're not doing like soy and corn and wheat, but instead you're doing things like grazing sheep or raising bees or actually having pollinator friendly plants that support bees that then pollinate crops that are nearby. You can actually combine an agricultural use and solar. You can do all of that beneath solar. You can graze sheep beneath solar arrays. And you know, we import almost all of our sheep. It's like 90% of our sheep come from, you know, probably New Zealand or something like that. So I've been working on this idea to have a dual use of farmland, basically to allow farmers to uh, install community solar arrays. So those are two megawatts, usually about 10 acres to 15 acres. And then the subscriptions from those solar projects have discounted rates for low and moderate income residents. So you, you can help make solar affordable and available because it's subscription to people who don't have a roof you know, our, 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 our renters uh, who also deserve to be able to participate in, in the clean energy revolution. So I've been working really hard on that. And we've, you know, it's a great idea. We, we've hit a major roadblock, which is that a lot of the landowners or the, the um, some of the existing users of the land don't want to do it. They want to continue to use the land for soy and wheat and, and corn and other kinds of commodity agricultural products, which is, you know, their businesses are invested in that and, you know, that's, that's their livelihood. So we are, you know, we're working on it. I had a, had a zoning text amendment that I brought through the county council uh, about a year ago. Didn't fare too well, you know, quite candidly, hmm. but I think we've, we've kind of started the conversation and I think it ultimately will, it will succeed. It will prevail. And it certainly is a, it's a big theme uh, in my candidacy, but you know, I think that we have the ability to power like a hundred thousand homes in Montgomery County from locally generated solar, you know, that is integrated with farming where farming is still done, but it's also on solar. And, you know, I bring this up because if this country is going to get on the path to sustainability, solar at scale, you know, is absolutely essential. Like Maryland needs, you know, tens of thousands of acres of solar energy. Every state needs tens of thousands of acres of solar energy. And so how is that going to happen? You know, I think state and local officials have a great opportunity to try to accelerate that, but there's going to be challenges, you know, with existing uses of that land. And, you know, we've, I think it's something we got to get focused on to make that transition happen if we want to, uh, you know, wind down coal, you know, because bottom line, power plants that run off of coal, like your electric car, it might feel good, but if it's burning coal, because that's where you get your energy from, you know, it's you're not having the impact that you think you're having. Yeah, I think that's super exciting. And sometimes excited to 
promote that and, and have other people think about that around the country. You mentioned as part of that answer that your candidacy, and I have not yet said that you are um, not only on the county council now, you are running for county executive currently. Indeed. Indeed. And, uh, you know, as we think about so many of these issues you just already touched on, of you know, we're, it really does feel like we're kind of at this transition time, right, for how we're going to how we're going to build this clean energy economy, how we're going to deal with that learning loss. I mean, there's so many pieces. So like when you think about being county executive, when you're running for county executive, kind of what is the, what is your, what do you feel like we need in terms of leadership, in terms of vision to kind of get us to over the hurdle on so many of these critical issues? Well, Montgomery County, I think needs what, uh, you know, I think what a lot of us involved in the new deal, you know, strive to aspire to, to provide, which is, forward-thinking leadership that is, you know, creative and inventive, that is embracing the future, you know, that is uh, embracing a growth mentality and is is trying to, you know, just foster and participate in and manage change for the better. And that's not often the local community's mentality, you know, or at least certain, you know, certain parts of the community, you know, there's, there's a, a lot of folks are, at, 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 you know, at, at least certainly where in the Washington region are like, hey, things are really great. Like, why would we want to change? And, you know, our challenge in Montgomery County is fundamentally, you know, we're, we're, we're slowing down, you know, we're, uh, that we have the same, we have fewer private sector jobs actually today than we had 10 years ago. You know, even though we're a very affluent county, we are no longer growing. And Virginia has successfully created a juggernaut of an economic engine. And now basically all the companies in the region are growing in Virginia and they used to grow in Montgomery County. And that's not sustainable. Like the county that we know and love was not built on that kind of foundation. And so trying to bring that, that, that agenda to the community and say, hey, we've got to get in the game here. We have to have a strong economic policy in this county or we're just going to continue to slip further behind. And then we won't have the funding for our schools and for our parks and our libraries. And it's going to be you know, harder and harder to live here because you're going to have to commute you know, like an hour and a half every day to a, a job that's far away because there's no job that's here for you. And I, I like to talk a lot about my kids. They're like, I want my kids to be able to live in this county if they, if they want to. And they need to have a job and they need to have a, a housing that they can afford. And those issues are just... You know, we're not doing that well on that. So, you know, fundamentally, I think that's kind of the vision is how can we embrace growth and change and vibrancy and and at the same time, you know, keep the the attributes of our community that we love and that what brought us, you know, attracts most people to want to live here. You know, that's that's the uh, that recipe, I think, is the recipe for success for our community. Yeah, thank you for that vision. As I said, I want I do want to circle back on kind of your path, if I can, into public service. Yeah. This, of course, is called an honorable profession because we believe uh, that uh, politics is an honorable profession and that um, an, an important profession. And I always find it so fascinating how kind of people got into public service and whether it was something they always thought they'd want to do. I know you mentioned you grew up in California. I'm sitting in California. You grew up in Oakland, and I, I gather your parents were pretty politically active and and you know on the. Definitely. Out there fighting for social justice. So I'm wondering, you know, how growing up in with that kind of family where you were active, was that kind of something that you always thought that you would want to do from the very beginning of your childhood? Or is, how did that evolve? My parents were, are and, and still are very active. Um, you know, I grew up, uh, I, I sort of joke sometimes, like I was the kid crawling around under the table at the PTA meeting. Um, you know, my, my, my mom ran the PTA or my you know, the neighborhood watch. My dad was involved with the ACLU. You know, my mom, uh, you know, was chaired the local business association. So they were just involved. And that opened my eyes to a lot of things. And, and they both care a lot about politics and social change. And so that was kind of the dinner table conversation for us, you know, was, was about government and, and politics and change. And for me personally, growing up, like, Michael Dukakis's loss in 19, uh, I guess that was 88, right? No, 84, was, it was really, um, you know, it had a big impact on me, you know, because what I couldn't understand was like, if the world is so obviously, you know, if things are so obviously going in the wrong direction, you know, under, the, under President Ronald Reagan, like, why did the whole country 
not agree with that. And, you know, that was kind of when I think that helped politicize me to, to understand that Democrats have to win in order for the communities to make progress. And when Democrats don't win, it's really disadvantaged communities that pay the biggest price. You know, like me, I'm, you know, I grew up, growing up in Oakland, California, like me and my family, we're not necessarily going to be as harmed if there isn't as much funding flowing into the schools or, you know, there aren't as many jobs that are being created in the community. But a lot of folks in my community really are. And that, you know, we've got to win. Like Democrats have to be able to win elections. And so I kind of came out of that with that mindset coming out of, you know, growing up in, in the community that the stakes are really high and that, you know, Democrats are the are the vehicle for social change, but they also have to win if they want to be able to make progress for the people they care about. You know, I wasn't necessarily the most hyper involved, but when I was in college, I uh, did an internship in Washington, started to find find some passion. And I was focused on the issue of social security. I got involved as a young person working on social security issues. And this was the 90s. So there was kind of like what was called a generational conflict over the future of social security and Medicare. And there were, there were folks who were saying that, you know, these programs were really a bad deal for young people. And anyway, that's a, sort of a long story. But I felt differently. You know, I felt like these programs are the core, the bedrock of the social contract. And, you know, they're, they're really like substantially reducing poverty and, and they're really important. You know, the New Deal is like the bedrock of our accomplishments in, in, uh, in politics. So I got involved in trying to, to protect social security. And this back in like 95, uh, after I completed my internship, came back to Washington, they hired me back. And I founded a group for young people that brought young leaders in Washington together to advocate around economic and budget issues, and particularly social security. So that uh, went really well. I got to know a lot of amazing mentors like uh, Arthur Fleming, who had been in the Franklin Roosevelt administration as the chair of the civil service. And he eventually hired me to run a national coalition that he was the chair of focused on social security. So I, I transitioned out of the nonprofit that I founded and ran and went to work on this coalition campaign with other mentors also like Roger Hickey and, and Bob Borisage and, and Heather Booth. And we basically built a, a progressive coalition to protect social security to, to kind of first get the Democrats you know, all in a row, and then to take it to the Republicans. And eventually that kind of culminated with when George W. Bush tried to privatize Social Security. You know, we, we orchestrated a national campaign to try to stop that. About that time, a friend of mine was the uh, president at Rock the Vote, and she asked if I would be interested in uh, taking on a role at Rock the Vote. And so, yeah, I guess before like 04, I became the political director at Rock the Vote. And that was just so much fun. You know, it's a, it's a household name and it really is a, a place where you can have incredible impact and, and be creative and innovative. And so we did a, a bunch of stuff in the, in the carry election cycle. And then during that election, actually my wife, Angela, she was the uh, Congressional Black Caucus's political director. She introduced me to a young state senator uh, or a uh, yeah, state senator running for U.S. Senate, uh, Barack Obama, and uh, you know she she was very involved in helping his Senate candidacy. And as I got to know him, I thought this guy is amazing. Like this guy is clearly going to be the president one day. Like there's just you know within like a couple times of meeting him, you knew him. like this guy is going to happen for him. And so you know I, I was just excited to be able to get to know him and thought, hey, if he runs for president one day, maybe I'll be part of that. Meanwhile, I ran for council in Montgomery County, did not win, but uh, got my degree in local politics the hard way. And, um, and then uh, Barack Obama announced he's running for president. So I, uh, I signed up and they asked me to come out to Chicago and I was the youth director. Uh, and my, my work at Brock the Vote you know, was sort of relevant there. And so I hit the ground early in the campaign, uh, working with all of like the thousands and thousands of college students and high school students who had 
helped compel and propel his candidacy and ultimately helped deliver Iowa and other early states, uh, which cascaded into his victory in, in you know, the general election. So that was like absolutely thrilling. It just felt like such a historically significant thing to be part of. And, you know, just to kind of help facilitate that working for someone who I just really was believed in and, and still do. And uh, anyway, wow, so much fun. Um, <laughs> and then I was faced with the challenge, like, hey, do I want to try to go work for the Obama administration or what? And, and I wanted to run for office. I wanted to basically try to do it myself, not run for president, but you know, just to be uh, in the policymaking role. So I ran for the county council in 2010 and crowded field of, of there were four incumbents. It's, you know, top four vote getters win. And uh, ended up getting more votes than three of them. And one of them stayed home. And uh, that's how I got elected to the county council. That's amazing. I love, I'm glad you talked about all that. I had some questions on some of it. So it's such an interesting journey you had. And I'm particularly interested in this work you did with around the youth vote and wondering, you know, how that now as an elected official makes you think about how you engage youth, how you get people, you know, to continue to be interested in government. It feels like everyone says, oh, younger generations don't care about politics. I I don't find that to be true, actually. And I'm just kind of curious about your perspective, you know, having done it and now being an elected official. That's a great question. You know, one of the things that I had concluded after working in youth politics and like youth voter campaigns in the 90s and early 2000s, you know, one of the things that I had concluded was that, you know, the nonprofit sector's ability to like really move the needle in a big way is it's it's tough. You can move the needle with young voters in a specific campaign without a doubt if you're willing to invest in the resources to knock on their doors and to find them where they are and get them involved in any congressional or senate campaign. There's absolutely a very direct path to increase youth voter participation, but to like really have that deeper, broader social impact, you got to have a presidential campaign. And that's what the Obama campaign became. Like He wanted young people to be part of his winning candidacy, and they knew it. Like They knew that he meant it and that it was real. And it wasn't just, you know, lip service. It was like, hey, I, you know, I need you to be part of this or I'm not going to win. And that, you know, that was a generational moment of youth political empowerment. And and since then, of course, it's been, you know, not as easy. I mean, there was a lot of disappointment that uh, among some, I think. And at the same time, you know, I, I, I guess I think that participation is is a little bit better than it used to be. As a local elected official, you know, it's it's not as easy. You just don't have the kind of resources of a presidential or let alone a congressional campaign. I personally make an effort to have like youth advisory councils, to have youth town halls, you know, to to meet with any student that wants to meet, you know, to to do anything I can to help inspire either that one kid or, or help strengthen that organization to make a difference. You know, for me overall, you know, I think part of the challenge is Montgomery County really we don't have our our due share of young people. We've been losing young workers to other parts of the region. And I'd like to get that back. You know, that's kind of an animating goal for my politics is hey, let's, you know, let's get to be once again a place that young people and young families, you know, really want to be and where there's jobs for them and there's housing for them. So I guess my my focus on you know, youth engagement in politics has shifted a little bit more to the policy side and and trying to help this county, you know, be a place that is more successful with with young adults, with young workers, and as a result has a brighter future. Yeah. Keep your kids there, as you said earlier in the talk, in our talk. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, again, like, it, it, it was, of course, it's up to them, but it's kind of an existential issue if like, you know, as a parent, you'd love to have your kids be close. And if they can't be close because there's no job for them, you know, there's no housing for them and there's really no future for them near you. So that's kind of a bummer. Yeah, like, you know, absolutely. Um, and I, I I like to talk about it that way because I, I think it kind of appeals to different generations to see a common interest in embracing growth and change. It's like, don't you want your kids to be able to have a future in your community? 
you know, of course you do. Well, let's talk about what it's going to take to make that happen. Yeah, I love that. Well, I've loved talking to you, Hans. And I, I have to just mention for our listeners here, because they can't see you that over your right shoulder is a very iconic uh, picture of Barack Obama, not surprisingly, given what we just talked about. And over your left shoulder is a guitar. So um, I will end by asking you to play us. No, I'm just kidding. Um. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, I, I've lost my chops. But that guitar uh, is one of like 11 that Gibson made for Rock the Vote that we gave to awardees in 2005 at the Rock the Nation Award. And we gave one to Barack Obama and we gave one to John McCain. And, you know, who, who knew they became the, uh, the rival candidates. But Barack Obama actually displayed his version of that guitar in his Senate office for a couple of years, um, which was pretty cool. But yeah, and anyway, I, I, I bought it thinking and maybe I will, you know, maybe my kids will play it one day or something like that. But, you know, who knows? We'll see what happens. It's very cool. I thought I asked about it. That's a cool story. Well, Hans, it was so great to see you. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for all you're doing in Montgomery County, a leader on so many important issues and uh, really appreciate you spending some time with us this afternoon. Thank you, Debbie. I love being part of the New Deal family and I've learned so much and you know, had so much fellowship and, and connection and I'm, I'm really grateful for it. So thanks for making it possible. You bet. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to An Honorable Profession. Please subscribe to hear more amazing leaders and keep asking your elected officials to be honorable. Boots Row Group produces podcasts. I'm Ryan Coonerty. And because we keep things honorable, no tax dollars were used in the making of this podcast.